Good afternoon, everyone. How are we all feeling? Good. Still energized on day three? So you've got lunch coming up in one hour. But first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Lachlan McIver. What can I say about Lachlan? So he's a rural generalist hailing from far north Queensland. He's a public health physician. He's done a PhD in the health impacts of climate change in Pacific Island countries. He's currently the Tropical Diseases and Planetary Health Advisor with MSF out in Geneva. He's got 50 scientific publications. And not only this, but he's a published author. He's written this book, Life and Death Decisions, which is really a memoir of a lot of his work uh, out in very extreme uh, war-torn parts of the world with MSF and the WHO. You can get a signed copy if you go up to uh, where the uh, lunch area is. You can catch up with Lachlan after this session. Really recommend checking this out. Not only that, Lachlan is also a poet. He writes poetry and also records music in his spare time. And I've just been listening, Lachlan, to The Serpent's Nest on Spotify. If punk rock is your jam, then yeah, definitely um, check that out as well. And this session is really a, it's a call to action on arguably the greatest but neglected crisis of our time. Without further ado, please put your hands together for Lachlan McIver. Thanks, Will. I'm impressed that the lengths to which you have gone to do your background work on me. That's, that's great. Thanks for putting the shout out for my music too. It is, it is a genuine honour to be here, folks. I've been a, a WEM admirer uh, from a distance for many years and it's an honour to be sharing the stage with the incredible lineup we've had this weekend. Bloody bomb doctors and tiger surgeons and the Himalayan paragliders. Uh, it's quite storied company that we've been keeping. Astronauts. Yeah, I, I'm humbled to be here. Um, is, it is customary in Australia to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from, from which we come and upon which we meet. So I'm, I'm honoured to, to hail from um, the traditional lands of the Mamu people, rainforest people in far north Queensland, uh, whose totem is the cassowary, fantastic uh, bird if you ever get the chance to see one, ideally in the wild. Um, and I'm also honoured to, to be here in Scotland where my name is not some sort of mispronounceable mess. Um, yeah, I've spent most of my life explaining to people how to, how to say my name and so this is the McIver family tartan and crest and, and motto. So yeah, cool that I can trot that out. It's the first time I've had that opportunity at a talk. Uh, sincere thanks to the WEM community for inviting me to be here. It's a fantastic conference and a fantastic community. And pushing boundaries and dynamic earth is right in my wheelhouse. So well played, WEM. Let's get into it. Um, Miller Miller, the place where I'm from, is famous for its waterfalls. In fact, the name Miller Miller in the language of the Mamu people means lots of water. Miller Miller Falls is the most, wa is the most waterfall, is the most photographed waterfall in the country. Uh, this is what most of the photographs that you find online tend to look like. This is what the waterfall actually looks like these days. Just to give you a little initial glimmer of where I'm heading with this talk. Um, the, the actual availability of water in far north Queensland has reduced over the last few decades, mainly due to deforestation in the last uh, 100 years or so since the area was colonised, including by my family. Um, and the other thing that North Queensland is famous for, of course, as you all know, is the Great Barrier Reef. I'm sure you also know what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef combination of ocean warming and acidification, industrial runoff, particularly from agriculture, is causing extensive coral bleaching. I'm a passionate scuba diver, I'm a dive master, it was my backup career, it still is my backup career, if the whole medicine thing doesn't work out. Um, and in the 20 years or so that I've been diving, we've effectively lost most of the world's largest coral reef, which is an absolute tragedy. I'm a rural doctor, a rural journalist, as Will said. That means a lot of this kind of thing out in uh, remote uh, communities in the deserts of Australia. Also means a bit of this kind of thing. You get to do the, the helicopter retrievals in, in unique parts of the world, like the Torres Strait, if you strap on some, some anaesthetic skills that I did along the way. Um, and yeah, at heart, I, I am but a humble rural doctor, but I've done some, some pretty gnarly things since I left Australia, and we're going to talk about a few of those to give you a sense of, of why I'm having such a grandiose title of my talk, The Ultimate Emergency. Three weeks ago I was in Vanuatu, in the middle of this. This is the worst cyclone in October in the Southern Hemisphere. 
Vanuatu is no stranger to cyclones. It's one of the most disaster-prone countries on Earth. Not just hydrometeorological disasters like cyclones, droughts and floods. It also has active volcanoes and it's prone to the odd um, uh, earthquake and tsunami. The reason I was in Vanuatu uh, was not so much for the cyclone, although that very rapidly became the main activity while I was there. I was there to support these two guys. That's Randy in the white shirt on the left and Ryan on the right. These are the first two Ni Vanuatu doctors to train as rural generalists in their country. Rural specialists, they're called, in the Vanuatu system. Um, and I'm very proud to, to have been supporting these guys in their professional development over the last few years. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. What are these guys doing here? They're, they're, doing a, they're reducing a fracture dislocation of a 14-year-old boy's um, uh, distal radius after he got blown out of the tree that he had climbed to try and secure the roofing of his house. This was our first casualty from Tropical Cyclone Lola and the first time these guys had used ketamine or done a, a sort of a closed reduction. So that was, that was pretty cool for them and I was pleased to be able to help. But these two guys are not only um, the, the doctors responsible for running the outpatient department and the emergency department for the largest country, uh, largest hospital in the northern half of Vanuatu, they also have to be very flexible and adaptable, as most extreme medicine folks are. They um, were called upon to lead the establishment of the emergency medical teams to deal with uh, not only the impacts on Espiritu Santo Island, where we were, but the outer islands that had, uh, had the cyclone batter through in the previous 24 hours and were expecting to receive casualties by particularly by boat um, over the subsequent days. So it was humbling to see these guys uh, learning on the job, thinking on their feet and responding to the needs. Really, really fantastic stuff. Why, why the hell was I in Vanuatu? Well, it actually wasn't my first time in Vanuatu uh, in a cyclone. Um, in 2015, Cyclone Pam struck Vanuatu and several other Pacific Island countries. This at the time was the worst cyclone in a generation to have struck Vanuatu. Their president was in tears as he reported the damage from Japan where he was attending a global conference on disaster risk reduction. Um, and I uh, was called upon to assist with the response to Cyclone Pam uh, because I had a role in the country, uh, which I'll come to in a moment. But dealing with, as many of you would know, the aftermath of a disaster in an already resource-constrained environment is very challenging and requires a lot of, uh, sort of, uh, again, thinking on one's feet, adapting to the, to the needs. So the emergency department in the National Referral Hospital in the capital city of Port Villa was almost immediately overrun with patients. Uh, there was the, 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 the traumatic injuries and a few deaths, unfortunately, that we expected to see. Um, there was also the um, a huge spike in respiratory complaints, largely from the burning of debris um, around, around town. And then, of course, the infectious diseases came after that. As you'd be aware, these tend to be the phases uh, post-disaster. The reason I was there with a role is because I'd been called upon to set up the intern training program uh, for the new graduates, uh, the new Ni Vanuatu doctors who are returning home from Cuba. You may be aware that the Latin American School of Medicine in Cuba is the world's largest medical school, but by some distance. It's a doctor factory. There's thousands of graduates a year uh, from around 100 different countries. Cuba is, is, to some extent, justifiably proud of its health system. The Cuban Medical Brigade, the Cuban doctors that work abroad, are its most uh, sort of famous export. And the Latin American School of Medicine uh, provides free scholarships to, to these uh, students from other developing countries. Um, for seven years of learning medicine in Spanish in a socialist system. Vanuatu, as they were preparing to have these 12 new graduates return home from Cuba, which represented a doubling of the total number of doctors in Vanuatu overnight, had the foresight, or admittedly late in the, in the game, to realise that they probably need to have some sort of program set up to integrate these new doctors. Um, they weren't used to having 12 doctors arrive at once. One or two per year was the, was the typical... Um, uh, intake trickling back home from Fiji and so I got the gig to to set up this this bridging program and the subsequent intern training program for these new graduates you see them here sort of all, all smiles and bloody skinny after seven years you know living in bunk beds and on, on rice and beans uh, learning medicine in Spanish in the other side of the world that's Ryan and Randy on the seated on the front left row there and it was an honour for me to uh, have this role, helping get these guys as up to speed as quickly as possible, uh, basically in the practice of medicine in their home country, which was to them very foreign. 
Why was I given that role? I'd, I'd been connected to Vanuatu for some years. You can see I'm kind of giving you my life story a little bit in reverse here. This guy's name's uh, Nixon Turkett, and he is my, I'm pr proud to call him my brother, um, according to the custom tradition of the Bene tribe in East Coast, Espiritu Island, uh, Vanuatu. I met Nixon in 2008. This is him squatting in a in a, um, the furnace on a copra plantation. Copra is the, the, the sort of the, the byproduct of um, harvesting coconut oil and is one of the main industries in, in Santo. I won't go into the whole story of how I met Nixon, but very briefly, that connection is now uh, 15 years old. Um, I was inducted into the tribe, which involved uh, drinking kava with the chief you see there and all his sort of bare-chested glory. We're all looking very serious because it was a serious ceremony. I'm looking particularly serious because I just had to club a, a sacrificial pig to death um, and be, be welcomed into the tribe. I'm getting a pat on the back there from, uh, from little Isaiah um, as the village all lined up to, to embrace me and I battled the urge not to vomit. There's pig's brains and skulls scattered all over the grass. Um, but over those 15 years, we've um, managed to do a lot, of, a lot of awesome stuff together. We started small, just with a couple of solar panels and building some water tanks and things. Now we've got a school, we've got an entire sort of new half of the, of the community, um, and we've got a pretty substantial business set up now um, as the only uh, fuel station outside the, the main town on the island. So development in Bene community has happened very rapidly over the last 15 years. And it was, it's been a, a, a fantastic learning experience for me to work with this community and see how community development uh, can be applied from real world experience, not just uh, from a textbook. Um, my time in Vanuatu, training these doctors, working with these communities, understanding what the needs were, particularly of rural communities in Vanuatu, led to a few of us setting up a small uh, international health organisation called Rocketship. It's an acronym, stands for Remote Opportunities for Clinical Knowledge, Education, Training and Support for Health in the Pacific. Yep, uh, pretty happy with that. <laughs> um, Rocketship's focus is to improve health in partnership in Pacific Island countries through stronger primary care. And our focus today has been mostly on, on training doctors, postgraduate training for doctors to become rural specialists, to be able to provide safe, quality primary care for rural communities and be able to stay in their communities or at least in their countries for the period of their postgraduate training rather than need to relocate to another country like Fiji or Papua New Guinea, which had um, hitherto been the case. We also did a lot of volunteer work, just providing uh, sort of health professional workforce support to area of extreme shortage, including roping in my mum. That's my mum there, uh, helping out with the, taking vital signs of the kids in the, in the clinic. She's a now retired midwife, but yep, dragged, out, dragged herself out of retirement to help with this clinic. And the um, sister Mary, who she's working with there, also came out of retirement to do this clinic because that community had a physical clinic but had never had an actual uh, you know, patient-based clinic in it for many years. The work we did sending volunteers to Vanuatu, setting up training programs eventually caught the attention of other Pacific Island countries and uh, we got called upon to assist with setting up a similar program in Timor-Leste. Had also had a huge influx of new doctors courtesy of the Cuban training system but didn't quite know what to do with them. Knew that they wanted to get them out to the districts but couldn't, well, basically they tried to send them out to the district under the Gustav government, Doctors for the Districts program, but these new graduates were not ready. The districts took one look at them and sent them straight back to Dili, the capital, said uh, we'll, we'll take them when they've got some training, thanks. So we set up a diploma in family medicine program that's now had several cohorts run through which caught the attention of other Pacific Island countries. The Kingdom of Tonga approached us to help do something similar for them. This is them doing an ALS course to qualify for, for their diploma, go on to their Master of Family Medicine course, which is the equivalent of a, a sort of college fellowship in the Pacific. Um, that's uh, the, the Tongan graduates uh, after having uh, completed their master's training. And now we've gotten new requests from the Solomon Islands to help them set up a postgraduate diploma in rural medicine. So. Primary healthcare system strengthening rural generalist medicine in the Pacific has been a huge part of my life and, and work over the last few years. But it's not my um, sort of main thing these days. Before leaving Vanuatu, I want to tell you about uh, uh, this doctor. His name's Richie. He's another one of those uh, Ni Vanuatu graduates of the Latin American School of Medicine. He was sitting alongside Ryan and Randy with the flower wreath in that photo from earlier. Very briefly, um, Richie is one of the best doctors I know. He, he was very clearly top of the class when these guys came back from Vanuatu. 
sorry, came back to Vanuatu from Cuba, and he proved himself so competent that he was uh, sent out to the rural hospitals to do his mandatory rotation before any of the other guys were. And um, this is me catching up with Richie in Port Villa, uh, en route to the north to do the cyclone response three weeks ago. So we were naturally kind of, you know, swapping beers and cyclone stories. Richie was out in the um, southern island of Tanna uh, when Cyclone Harold bashed through uh, three years ago. You remember Cyclone Pam in 2015 was the worst cyclone in a generation? Well, this was another worst cyclone in a generation. Now, you can't have two worst cyclones in a generation. There's a, there's a trend happening here. There's something wrong with that logic. Um, Richie was telling me that he was the... I've got his permission to tell this story, by the way. He was the only doctor on, at Lenacal Hospital. This is serving a community of about 40,000. Um, the hospital lost power, lady came in in labour with a uh, distended, tense abdomen and vaginal bleeding. Richie realised without the help of an ultrasound or anything fancy like that, that this lady had a placental abruption and needed urgent, urgent um, retrieval. Lined up some relatives, started getting blood out of them, doing a bent top cross match and barrelling blood into her as he's on the radio to Port Villa trying to organise a plane. He was hoping to be able to get an obstetrician on the plane out to help him in Lenark Help. They said, look, that's your problem, mate. If you can get the patient back to Port Villa, we can do something. But until she gets here, it's on you. The plane at least came. But unfortunately, as it was landing on the island, it uh, blew a tyre. One of these little sort of um, twin prop three uh, wheel planes, one wheel at the front, one wheel either side. So now this plane's got a flat tyre. Richie's now negotiating with the pilot about when they'll be able to get the wheel fixed and get replaced, and the pilot's saying, well, look, we'll have to, we'll have to wait until we get a spare tyre from Port Villa. Richie's saying, listen, this patient's going to die in the next few hours if we don't get her out. Is there any way we can pump up the tyre and take off? The pilot said, yeah, we can pump up the tyre and take off, but then we're not going to be able to land again. Richie said, look, it's life or death, mate. Um, what do you want to do? And the pilot said, your call, doc. So, on they get into the plane, Richie, the nurse, the um, patient, the patient's partner, and the screaming three-year-old toddler, who is also dependent on this, you know, mother. Um, pilot pumps the, the tyre up. They manage to just take off off the airstrip in Tanner and then have one, as, as Richie describes it, one of the most terrifying flights of his life into Port Villa. Um, as they're coming into land, of course, the tyre's gone down again, so they have to do this sort of two-wheeled landing, which is looking out, seeing tarmac barrel past him out the window. Land this plane, uh, get in the ambulance, go out to Port to Villa Central Hospital and Richie, who started the day at 5am, now finds himself at midnight doing an emergency caesarean and hysterectomy for this completely ischemic uterus. Both uh, mother and baby survived remarkably and just goes to show what kind of doctors are out there uh, in the most resource deprived environments doing fantastic work. So pushing boundaries. The kind of um, doctors and the work that I've been describing, these, these beautiful colleagues and friends in Vanuatu, to me is a great example of how you can push professional boundaries. Right? That's, that's theme one I'm going to hit. There's two more to come. Um, after having done my training as a rural journalist in Australia, having set up Rocket Chip and developed this community um, connection in Vanuatu, I had the, the, the um, great fortune to land a job with the World Health Organization's South Pacific office. I was working specifically on climate change and health. This was an interest that I'd been, uh, or interest is a funny way to put it, it makes it sound like a hobby. This was a, 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 something that had been concerning me increasingly for several years as I'd done more training in, in public health and tropical medicine, I did my masters and then a public health physician training. Um, and uh, I had done enough research and, and I guess uh, gained enough experience that WHO gave me this job to lead a project uh, looking at the, the vulnerabilities of 12 different Pacific Island countries to the health impacts of climate change and figure out national adaptation plans to try and reduce or avoid those risks to health. The Pacific, as you would be aware, is, is probably ground zero for, for climate change, the physical effects and the health effects. Not least because uh, these are island communities, obviously. This sign is from South Tuara Atoll, the capital of Kiribati, which is one of the most uh, climate change vulnerable countries in the world. The highest point, as you can see there, of the capital is three metres above sea level, and most of the population live within one metre above sea level. As the sea is, is warming, it's rising. As it's rising, it's becoming more acidic. Uh, the salt is intruding into the soil. The fisheries are dying off. The crops are dying off. The changing weather patterns is changing the habitats of mosquitoes that spread diseases, particularly dengue fever. And the warming temperature is uh, increasing the incidence of food and waterborne diseases. 
So we've got uh, malnutrition or compromised food security, compromised water, um, increased infectious diseases, vector-borne, water-borne, food-borne, etc. And um, we've also got the problem of non-communicable diseases, which I'll come back to in a moment. This uh, photo is of a beautiful group of kids. It's on Kiowa Island in Fiji, but these are refugees from Tuvalu. They've had forced um, dislocation due to climate change. These are probably the world's first climate change refugees, or at least among the first uh, climate change refugees. Um, really tragic stuff to see. As the um, project rolled out, I was roaming around the Pacific. A lot of it involved you know, pretty dry stuff, you know, meetings with uh, epidemiologists. I'm not saying epidemiology is boring, Charlotte. I'm saying it's really cool. Um, but we're analysing data, trying to figure out what is the relationship between the incidence of, for example, gastroenteritis in the Federated States of Micronesia and temperature and rainfall patterns trying to figure out what can we do about this problem. Like uh, we're looking at some um, really cheap and easy hydrogen sulfide test kits to, to check water quality. Um, and trying to figure out not only what, how can we understand the problem and tackle it, but how can we even <laughs> sort of deal with what seems like the unmanageable uh, nature of some of these problems. This is the island of Nauru, which you, you may uh, have heard of. Tragic story, Nauru. Um, just a little potato-shaped island in the middle of the Pacific. It's not a low atoll, it's a raised atoll, so they don't so much have problems with sea level rise. Their problem is more human-caused. The main economy of Nauru of the 20th century was, was phosphate from the, the basically the deposits of migratory seabirds over millennia. And so within the space of a few decades, the Nauruans, who today number 10,000 in total, uh, went from being among the poorest to among the richest per capita people in the world. But with that, um, came a sort of uh, decline in their uh, sort of willingness and interest to do farming and fishing. Um, and with the wealth came a greater dependence on basically uh, uh, energy-dense, nutrient-poor food, but just rubbish, um, to the point where Nauru has such high rates of non-communicable diseases, obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, that they are the first country in the world uh, to ex have experienced a decrease in life expectancy it, without it being sort of affected by HIV or war. Think about that. Um, my work with WHO eventually took me to Geneva, and they sent me to a few other places doing a few other wild things, like a cholera outbreak in, in Tanzania, which was pretty grim, particularly when part of the response of the, of the community was to um, start charging people for water and uh, spreading rumours that the, that the uh, cholera vaccine was an attempt to sterilise the population by the, by the sort of evil white men. So tricky, tricky challenges you experience in outbreak investigation and response in some of these places. I eventually realised I'd reached the end of the road with what WHO could offer, because they're pretty hopeless when it comes to sort of human resource and contract management, as Charlotte and I've been discussing over breakfast. And so um, I needed to find another gig and I was already in Geneva, so I went knocking at uh, MSF headquarters and was very fortunate to land a role with them. That uh, was a headquarters role. I was the infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance advisor, but my boss, who gave me the job, sort of uh, basically um, was willing to let me have a whack at it, also said, look, we're going to need to send you to the field just to check you've got what it takes. So he sent me to a project that he charmingly described as the arse end of MSF. It was uh, sort of a civil war zone in the world's largest swamp in the northern part of South Sudan, where I was a paediatric doctor for a couple of months. Fantastic learning experience. Never would have imagined that I would have to be so comfortable seeing so many comatose children in a tent at one time, these little, little kitties with temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius and GCS of three. Um, without any kind of, you know, critical care or high dependency unit, um, or with most of them with cerebral malaria, possibly and or meningitis, possibly and or TB meningitis, and it's also a hot spot for, for visceral leishmaniasis, which this little boy, um, you know, managed to recover from. Uh, it's very gratifying when these little comatose, febrile kitties wake up after a few days of IV artesanate and keftriaxone and can sort of shake your hand and ask for a biscuit. I was also dispatched to the Democratic Republic of the Congo on, uh, on a pretty bizarre mission to try and figure out what did antibiotic stewardship look like in a war zone in a very busy surgical hospital with about four different antibiotics available in the hospital, but about 10 different antibiotics available at the local market that people just 
mixing up with whatever and taking orally or via enemas or whatever um, on the advice of their sort of, well, most of them were essentially witch doctors. It was, however, a very short visit because our drivers got uh, ambushed and kidnapped. The project was suspended and we were all evacuated. And um, by this time in my life, I'm going to share with you all that um, there was a few things happening. Uh, working for MSF doesn't uh, mean, mean you don't earn much money. Geneva is a very expensive place to live. I was feeling very isolated from my family and friends. I was feeling detached from, from Rocket Chip, this organisation that I'd helped start, which is now going gangbusters on the other side of the world. And I got severely depressed, had a mental breakdown. Um, I still had to keep working because I needed money, but this picture is of me doing a locum back in the Torres Strait Islands uh, where a head torch is, is an essential kit. <laughs> uh, just, just, I mean, you see the pain, right, in your eyes, in my eyes. I'm not sure why I took that photo, but um, yeah, burnout's a real thing. It's an absolute fuck of a thing. Um, I came very close to taking my own life. Uh, on that occasion and, and, and on a couple of occasions over the next few years. Um, and the second message I want to include in my little talk today is about pushing personal boundaries and how we need to be aware of what it feels to come up right up against those limits, right up against those boundaries. Because I thought, naively and foolishly, as some of you may have um, thought along life's way, that, that I was kind of immune to that. You know, I was able to do most things and just kept piling things onto my plate and everything was fine until it wasn't and I imploded on myself like a neutron star. So if anyone's feeling like that, I hope I'm not triggering anyone by the way, if you've, if you've experienced that, if you know colleagues have experienced that, uh, there is help available 24 hours a day. Don't, don't, be, don't be shy, don't be ashamed, uh, don't be timid about reaching out. Help is available uh, and, and we are not superhuman despite what society might uh, kind of demand or expect from us. So I survived, obviously. I got myself out of the hole. It's a lot of work and blood and sweat and love and bloody psychological counselling. Wrote a book, uh, as Will was kind enough to mention, and some, some other cool people have been saying some nice things about it too. It, it is a memoir, but that's not really the point. Uh, that, the, the story of my sort of life and medical misadventures and personal shenanigans is really just a Trojan horse. This book's about serious stuff, global health crises that affect us all, but which we largely ignore, the health impacts of climate change, indigenous health inequities, the rise and rise of drug resistant infections. And uh, yeah, I've just felt kind of compelled to try and get those messages out there. Um, and it's great that the book now exists and you can get a copy. Um, and it was a big part of my healing too. It was, it was a very therapeutic process writing this thing. Got married, my relationship didn't completely um, collapse due to my mental breakdown. We got married in a, in a beach in Polynesia, it was all fantastic. And then like any good new husband, I then buggered off uh, on a mission to Mozambique, um, which, <laughs> which had just been battered by a second cyclone uh, of the season in the first month of the cyclone season. Um, I was there to help try and set up a, a planetary health project. The new job I had with MSF is as the planet, Tropical Diseases and Planetary Health Advisor, and I was trying to figure out what the hell that meant uh, on the job, setting up a, a project with that as the theme. I'll let my boss uh, explain it to us if, uh, if this video will work. Not quite sure how to make that work. Is uh, anyone from the back able to help me? Oh, this looks promising. Environment is changing. Temperatures and sea levels are rising, and we'll see more frequent and extreme weather events like heat waves, cyclones, and floods. People will be forced to leave their homes. We know that the most vulnerable people will be the most affected. We know this because we're already seeing them in our waiting rooms. We do know that the environment has an impact on health. It's my boss. We are seeing now malaria in places where they were not before because the mosquito now can survive. We see introduction of mosquito transmitted diseases such as Zika or Dengue in urban settings in a larger scale. If the water changes temperature, the Vibrio cholera can survive easier. So there is a direct link between environment and environmental conditions and mainly 
the vector transmitted diseases. Planetary health is a relatively new health discipline. Uh, it focuses on the changes that humans are making to our environment and the impacts that that has on human health. These changes to the environment destabilize the natural ecosystem, causing climate change and pollution of our air, soil and rivers. This, in turn, affects the water we drink and the air we breathe. It means we will see disruptions to our food production systems and changing patterns of diseases such as malaria. It means we may see new diseases we didn't know before and also the re-emergence of other diseases. Our health depends upon the well-being of the planet and the well-being of the planet depends on how we act. It is all linked. We can cure people but we also have to avoid making people sick. So we have a double responsibility as a medical organization of restoring physical health but maintaining environmental health to avoid people getting sick tomorrow. And for doing that, we need to take our own responsibility to be the most environmental friendly medical organization we can be. The climate crisis is a public health crisis. We must take action together. Right, so just a small pretty easy, straightforward job um, that I had then taken on as the medical advisor for this topic. We need to figure out what we meant when we talked about planetary health from an MSF perspective. The Lancet talks about it like this, as planetary health being the health of human civilizations and the natural systems upon which we depend, upon which we depend being the, the key thing there. Um, you're all aware that uh, due to sort of economic development over the last uh, few centuries, human beings are in general uh, happier, well, sorry, not, maybe not happier, healthier and living longer than ever before, right? That's, that's, uh, that's indisputable. But we have also uh, sort of, uh, forced the planet to pay a huge price for our own sort of, you know, health and well-being. So the impact of humans on the sort of planetary systems, basically since the Industrial Revolution, has led geologists to define a new geological era the Anthropocene, the, the, the human-influenced era, and what an influence it has been. From an MSF perspective, because we are a medical humanitarian organisation, we're primarily concerned with the health impacts in humans related to this interaction between humans, animals and the environment. And so um, in trying to tackle this problem, you know, MSF's a pretty decent-sized organisation, but you know, it's, uh, it's not omnipresent. Um, we decided that there was three parts to it for us. We had to understand what the, the sort of health impacts were for our patients, this kind of medical operational element. We had to be a responsible humanitarian actor and reduce our own ecological footprint, carbon emissions and other forms of, um, of impact as much as possible. And a big part of MSS philosophy is 10 one yards bearing witness, advocating for the patients and populations with whom we work. It's no, uh, shouldn't be a surprise and it's certainly not a coincidence that uh, MSF's presence, represented by the white dots, is mostly in the world's most climate vulnerable countries, represented by the sort of orange and red shading. Um, uh, these are the countries that have the, the greatest humanitarian and health needs, and they are also those that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. They are also those who have effectively contributed the least to the problem. So there's a really fundamental and terrible injustice there that should anger us all, I believe. When we look at what these kind of health problems are related to this definition that, that uh, we're seeing in MSF projects, this really crude word cloud shows the kinds of things that we are already seeing, we have been seeing for decades, that relate to this interaction between humans, animals and the environment and are thus sort of you know, planetary health topics. These topics are consistent with how WHO frames the climate change and planetary health topic, acknowledging that climate change is only a part of the planetary health sort of concept. Margaret Chan, previous WHO DG, referred to climate change as a defining issue for, for global health this century. She wasn't wrong. Climate change hasn't gone away. We've just been a bit distracted the last few years. 
Um, the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the world's largest collaboration of scientists in history. It's convened under the auspices of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. They've been looking into this topic for, for decades. They don't do the research, they examine the research that has been done and then summarise it in what they call synthesis reports. Sorry, assessment reports. The IPCC has just released their sixth assessment report in the last couple of years, and it is bad news. Um, the majority of uh, illnesses that cause deaths now are due to diseases that are climate sensitive. This does not say that 69.9% of all the deaths that occur are due to climate change. That's, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that the diseases that cause deaths in humans are mostly sensitive to changes in climate. Um, and just in case anyone was uh, uh, under any doubt about sort of how we got here, uh, this looks a bit busy, the graph, but it's very simple. It just shows the correlation between uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations and temperatures at the surface of the Earth. So um, over hundreds of thousands of years, there has been this very close correlation between atmospheric CO2 and, and, and global surface temperatures. What has changed is that since modern humans came along, and particularly since we discovered how to dig up the bloody fossilised remains of dead dinosaurs and prehistoric, fossil, uh, prehistoric forests and burn them, aka the Industrial Revolution, we have been increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere far, far, far faster than has ever happened in the history of the planet. And what that means is that temperature is rising far faster than any other time in the history of the planet. It's not the hottest the planet's ever been, and it's not the highest concentration of carbon dioxide that we've ever seen in planetary history, but it certainly is in half a million years and definitely is in human history. It's getting worse fast. Um, you would have noticed, I'm sure, these changes, they're happening right now, they're happening to all of us. July was the hottest month ever recorded. This year is going to be the hottest ever recorded, beating the record set by last year, well, the last several years. Um, so this, this cannot have escaped anyone's attention. Uh, and the science is absolutely clear. Climate denial, by the way, is a, is a, is a luxury only afforded to those who you know, have the means to um, sort of shelter and delude themselves in air conditioning in wealthy countries. The um, sixth assessment report from the IPCC, as I said, it makes for pretty, um, pretty apocalyptic reading. If you go through the entire report, as I've done, and you summarise of the categories of climate-sensitive health risks, um, the key messages from the IPCC are that the estimates of the climate change attributable burden of disease are worse than they had previously thought, and the confidence with which they are sure that these issues are linked with climate change is higher than they had previously thought. Um, the WHO estimate of the current mortality that is avoidable deaths due to climate change is 250,000 deaths per year. That is wrong. Why am I so confident about that? Because as WHO themselves say, that figure of 250,000 deaths per year is only due to four categories of climate sensitive disease. That's malaria, malnutrition, heat stress, and diarrheal disease. Whereas the health impacts of climate change go far beyond that and the true burden, the true number of people that are already dying unnecessarily every year due to climate change is in the millions. It's in the millions. And that's, that's, all, that's going to be an underestimate as well. Because this, we just don't have the, the full picture. We don't have the science. Um, we've got a paper coming out in the next couple of weeks in PLOS Climate that points out the gaps in the IPCC sixth assessment report, particularly as they pertain to humanitarian settings. Keep in mind what the IPCC does. They only review the science that has been done. They don't perform it themselves. So no one is looking into the relationship between climate change and uh, meningitis in the Sahel or, or Ebola in, uh, in, in East Africa or uh, you know, even um, something as, as relatively well known as measles. No one's looking into this because it only affects these kind of poor people in, in developing countries where too few people are doing research. So we don't have a full picture of the health impacts of climate change or the sort of human cost of, of planetary ill health, but it's, it's worse than, than uh, any figures would, uh, that are currently available would indicate. You can probably see where I'm going with these. These are what are referred to variously as either planetary boundaries or Earth system boundaries. These are the sort of um, the 
those natural systems upon which human civilization depends. This is what we're talking about here. There's nine of them officially, and we have already transgressed. Sounds like we're just kind of being a bit naughty. We have already transgressed six of them. So we are using the planet's resources at an unsustainable rate. We, we humans, no, no one else is doing it. No other species is messing up the habitat that we all share to this extent. Um, so yeah, we are already far beyond what is a sustainable way of living on this planet, and we don't really have a planet B, right? You've heard the cliche. Um, the, the, this is the distribution of who are the worst transgressors around the world, in terms of how many of those boundaries are being transgressed. And basically, what it boils down to is that we are using two planets worth of planets, which is pretty bloody stupid. This is, this is within our control, by the way. Um, and where I'm going with this is that we as a, as a community, we as a bunch of sensible health professionals um, who understand this problem and who have an understanding of how science works and how these things affect health, have a responsibility, I put it to you. So planetary boundaries is the third thing we're pushing here. Not just pushing, pushing through, transgressing. Right, so, but don't panic. There are things that can be done. Uh, I'm a big Douglas Adams fan, by the way. I think he's an absolute genius. Uh, and if anyone has not yet read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, just go out and get your hands on a copy. Forget about my book, just read this. <laughs> read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Fantastic. So, we took an oath. Most of us took an oath, right? First, do no harm. And this is something that we need to bear very much front of our minds. Individually and as a society, we need to not do harm. And uh, whenever we are emitting carbon or creating waste or m causing another species to become extinct, we are doing harm. Not just harm to the physical environment or to other animals, we're doing harm to ourselves. And human beings, in my experience, are fundamentally pretty selfish creatures. And even if we don't care about other species or the environment that we live in or even other humans, we care about ourselves. These, these are issues that affect us now not problem of future generations or people in faraway countries. So let's think about the impact of, of our decisions and our actions in terms of what it means for our health and the health of others via these planetary health pathways. We have a responsibility, I believe, as, as, as health professionals to get informed. That's what we're doing right now. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of these issues to different extents, but there's, there, we have the ability to educate ourselves and educate others Right? Health professionals are very well respected. Let's not mess that up. Let's, let's, let's use that, let's leverage that, capitalise on that. If we can um, be advocates for uh, action to address these problems, we will be listened to because they are health problems. We're not, we're, not, we're not getting way out of our lane here and all of a sudden chaining ourselves to trees or something. These are health problems and we are health professionals, we have a responsibility, a professional, ethical, moral mandate to educate, inform and enable policy change. There are specific ways you can do it. Uh, there's some great organisations that do it. Doctors for the Environment, Healthcare Without Harm, the Climate and Health Alliance. If you're wondering where to start, start there. Okay, they're, they're very sort of welcoming, active, experienced groups, including here in the UK and in many other countries. And um, if you're up for it, go beyond just the sort of educating yourself, informing others, and you know, signing up for a weekly newsletter from, uh, from Dr. C Environment. Get politically engaged. Um, the Conference of Parties, the annual get-together of the world's governments to ostensibly tackle climate change, as they did here in Glasgow, well, sorry, down the road in Glasgow a couple of years ago, it's happening again, it's in Dubai this year. Uh, they've got, the, the, for the first time, there's a health day at the Conference of Parties um, with much hoopla, as you can see, WHO's going to be there, MSF's going to be there. But if you're sceptical about the Conference of Parties on Climate Change happening in one of the world's largest petro states, you're not alone. Uh, and if you're sceptical about what will be the impact of having a health day at this shindig, you're also not alone. So, if you're interested in this topic, if you want to understand it better, if you want to get engaged and really try and make a difference. Should be speaking to people about this. Should be speaking to politicians about this, policy makers, the media. I'm going to be doing a bunch of interviews in the lead up to COP talking about these huge problems and huge gaps in terms of what the evidence is and what we are not doing to address the problem. 
It's not all bad news. I'm going to finish with a couple of examples of what MSF is doing to try and uh, address this planetary health emergency. Very quickly, uh, Madagascar, of course, as you know, does not look like this. That's a ridiculous combination of animals, by the way, to be in Madagascar. Madagascar looks more like this, unfortunately. Uh, the capital, Antananarivo, is incredibly polluted. The island itself is extremely uh, denuded, degraded, deforested. Uh, it's overpopulated, it's extremely poor. Um, and what that means is that there's severe malnutrition across much of the country. There is uh, rising cases of um, environmental and planetary health linked diseases like intestinal schistosomiasis, and there's increasing severity and frequency of cyclones battering the East Coast. So I'm saying there's not, um, there's, uh, not just bad news, I'm trying to put a positive spin on this by saying we as MSF are collaborating with a local NGO called Nitan Sik, who is all about um, sort of environmental and community health, and a fantastic organisation called Health in Harmony, which I highly recommend you check out, um, to support the health of rainforest communities and in, in doing so enable them to stay put, not be forced to dislocate and be the stewards and protectors of the rainforest that we all need to breathe. You imagine an organisation like MSF trying to figure out how are we going to measure the impact of our work, not just by number of patients seen or number of cases of malaria treated, but deforestation avoided and carbon emissions avoided. Pretty gnarly paradigm shift that's going on back at, uh, back at headquarters. We're also partnering with the World Mosquito Program in, in Tegucigalpa in Honduras, uh, releasing Wolbachia-infected 80s mosquitoes. You might have heard about this technology. It, it's a naturally occurring organism, Wolbachia. World Mosquito Program um, has proven in, uh, so it's over 10 or a dozen countries now, including in far north Queensland, where I'm from, where dengue was endemic and is now eliminated, that this technique works. The, uh, the Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes can't or have significantly reduced transmission of um, dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and we're partnering with them doing this uh, project in Tegucigalpa, which I'm involved in. I'll be heading to, to Honduras to check out in a couple of weeks. Um, that is already getting the attention of other Central American governments that are going to follow suit. And there are sort of conceptual things that we can be doing individually as health professionals and within the health systems in which we work to advocate for the changes that are necessary. This is just a, a, don't try and read the whole diagram now, but check out Courtney Howard's article in Lancet Planetary Health um, Journal to, to try and get a sense of what this means concretely for you as a health professional in the system in which you work. All of these changes are possible. They are economically vi viable. That's also been proven time and time again. This was, you know, I was at a, a um, planetary health meeting in Geneva last week. We had you know, one of Professor Nick Stern's colleagues pointing out the latest modelling about what it means to transition to, to a um, clean energy economy. It is, it is absolutely financially viable and cost effective. There's a bit of short-term uh, pain involved um, to get the technology in place, but the technology exists and it, is, um, it will be a fantastic return on investment, and it will be far more costly if we do not act. So if anyone tries to tell you that, that it's too expensive to transition away from fossil fuels, fossil fuels, that's bullshit. It is absolutely cost effective. And my final point here is that we as health professionals, we as a WEM community, have the ability and responsibility, I would say, to see and treat the planet as a patient. Uh, when we pollute the air and we chop down the forest, we are causing respiratory failure of the planet, right? We, we need these systems to breathe. When we mess up climate and we change weather systems, we are causing cardiac failure. When we eliminate other species and, and, uh, and sort of you know, decimate the biodiversity of the planet, we're causing brain death to the planet. The Earth systems are sort of analogous to body systems. We have been trained to diagnose and respond to pathology, to symptoms and signs of illness and systems failures. Uh, and because these are all linked to illness and failure and death in humans, we are very much within our rights, I believe, to understand and act to try and address these, these, uh, these, these emergencies. So it's the ultimate emergency, my friends. If you haven't yet, go and say g'day to Jake and Teddy at the MSF store up there. Uh, I've got some, I'm nearly out of books, there's one or two left, but you can get some vouchers to get a discount from my book, support your local bookstores. Uh, and thanks again to Wem for having me, it's been a hoot.
Okay, if you've got any thoughts, comments, or questions for Lachlan, please raise your hand in the biosphere. Equally, we're taking questions online as well. And to do that, if you just go to the, the session, click Watch Now, and at the bottom of that, you'll see there's a Q&A. So whether you're here in the audience live or watching from home, please send your thoughts in now. We've just got, not got very long, we've got about six minutes or so for questions. So we'll just take a question from the floor to start with. Uh, Shauna. Thank you so much. That was really sobering. And um, I'm usually outside of the climate um, space, but I've been getting more ensconced in it over the past few months. And one of the things I've been learning from non-health climate experts is the narrative of um, how uh, responsibility is being um, pawned off. And so what I, my understanding is that you know the, the corporations and industry holds the bulk of the responsibility for forging change. Uh, and this started with the narrative of, first of all, it's not real, and convincing pol policymakers it's not real. And most recently, saying the biggest change we as individuals can do is buy carbon offsets and work individually. And my understanding is that's, that's not the solution. And so I was wondering, um, where is that the same thing as you've heard? And if so, you know, what are the impacts in terms of storytelling and psychology and acting at the large scale industry level and policy making level? There's a lot wrapped up in your question and comment. I mean, that phenomenon you're describing about uh, you know being sort of recommended to uh, sort of focus on carbon offsetting, that's, that's just magician's tricks, that's just misdirection. Um, what, is, what is required is for us to go beyond this belief that technology or the market or capitalism will come up with solutions because it always has mm -hmm. to understanding that no no we are deep in a hole here and the only way to get out is to have political commitment and courage beyond just the next election cycle to, to think in terms of decades and generations which is very rare in politicians um, and that there needs to be sort of less carrot and more stick basically for for um, the corporate sector to, to behave itself because their vested interest is just making money for shareholders. Um, and in the short term, what that means is, you know, digging more coal up out of the ground and burning it. The, the technology to switch to, to a re, you know, renewable energy system is, is, as, is available and viable. It just needs a bit of investment and we just need to get over that hump mm. and we, we should be able to then uh, transition to a, to a sustainable energy economy. Mm. Now, that doesn't fix the problem of all the species that we've made extinct or all the forests we've chopped down or anything else, but it's not a question of how. It's a question of when. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, how the, the climate denialism has given way to this era of greenwashing, mm. and you alluded to that, Lachlan, in the, you know, the involvement of oil and gas industry in uh, things like COP28 and how embedded they are in, in well, they, they pr present themselves as the solution when mm. in fact you know, they're a huge part of the problem. Yep. And um, yeah, the, the current political system is failing us, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. And the market, market failure and political yep. failure, yeah. Um, yep, another question at the back there, please. Thank you for your presentation. I, I noticed something I noticed recently, personally, is I, you know, I had been a public employee in the United States, I had prior military, and I went and looked at some of my own investments, which were kind of innocuous, and I was basically supporting every industry I, I oppose, and I, I think that's something people need to look at, just because you may be investing in something that has high return, look at what it actually is doing, and it may be totally, you know, morally reprehensible to what you thought you were doing. That, that's, a, that's a really good point, and I think that, that is absolutely belongs in the category of what you can do as an individual. Uh, most of us, unknowingly, are, are supporting these uh, sort of environmentally and, and health-damaging uh, industries and, and companies. So, yeah, looking at your portfolio, even, even your superannuation, I'm not sure what it's called in other countries, but your, your sort of pension funds, um, it, you're able to assess those and you know, switch to more ethical investments, either sort of manually or you know, through advisors that know what, you do, know what they're doing. But I think there needs to be a, definitely a move towards a critical mass of people who are, who are rejecting investments in these, in these you know, sort of damaging and dangerous companies. Yep. Any more questions from the floor? Please raise your hand. Yes, one at the front right here, please.
Thank you, Lachlan. Um, just the issue of air travel, I'm, I'm never quite clear of its contribution to the, the whole catastrophe, but I'm always concerned that uh, both the humanitarian organisations, NGOs, and all of us here personally, are we all doing enough? We've all flown here from all corners of the globe. Should we, should we still be doing this, and what are humanitarian organisations doing to address that issue? Yeah, it's another great question. Will and I were just talking about this before, before the presentation started. It's a, it's a, a question that I've grappled with myself. Uh, you know, even to the point I, to, I felt obliged to include a footnote in my book about it because I, I really don't want to, to be or be perceived to be being hypocritical, flying all over the place and doing all this work and then saying, you know, climate change is bad, we need to reduce our emissions. The um, contributions from air travel to the sort of global carbon emissions are, are significant. Right? Not, not as much as like, uh, say, uh, sort of concrete factories or aluminium smelting, but, but high, high, and particularly on a per capita basis. So reducing our personal air travel or being more strategic, uh, uh, sort of efficient about it is, is key. It, but it, ultimately, it, it comes down to a personal choice, right? I think this is an area where uh, carbon offsetting is really useful if the companies are doing it in, in a credible way, not just necessarily planting trees, but investing in sustainable aviation fuel. There are better and worse performers in this, and you can go some way towards offsetting your personal impact by you know, paying a small premium to invest in those um, kind of uh, activities or initiatives. But ultimately, you know, if most of us are involved in, in healthcare in some way, that usually involves some level of travel, and particularly for, say, the, the humanitarian sector, we can't, you know, respond to an epidemic or, you know, you know treat war-wounded patients via Zoom. So there's, there's limits for everyone and every organisation to how much they can reduce their, their emissions, but there are definitely efficiencies that can be made, there are reductions that can be made, and there are investments that we need to collectively and individually make to enable that travel to go on, uh, but to have less of an impact, less of a damaging impact overall. Mm. But it's a thorny topic. Very much so. Yeah, thanks for raising that. It's a great question. Yeah. Okay, one final question. If anyone's got anything to say. Yes, sir. Uh, gentlemen, back left, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, being healthcare professionals, we know that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis of healthcare, we have to uh, incorporate sustainable duty, like maybe uh, the amount of medical equipment that we use, disposable stuff. I know discussions are going on, like even in the NHS, to create more sustainable ways of delivering healthcare. But is, has that come up enough? Like we are all medical professionals, we are doing it on a daily basis, the amount of disposable stuff we do in terms of patient safety, but that is something to be considered more, is it not? Yeah, look, if I understand that the crux of the question is um, how do we provide more sustainable and environmentally sort of friendly health care without compromising the quality of care? Is that, is that essentially at the core of it? Yeah, I was really pleased to hear um, Martin talking in, in his excellent presentation it was Saturday, wasn't it? The, the Martin, our, our, our amazing bomb doctor, talking about how um, the pushing of boundaries in a clinical setting need not mean compromising the quality of care. That needs to remain at the heart of what we do, right? Um, but there are definitely efficiencies and improvements that can be made. Um, with just looking at it from an MSF perspective, we're really grappling with the amount of medical waste that we generate. I mean, our, our emissions is one thing, you know, getting ourselves and all our equipment to these very remote locations, um, you know, generates a lot of carbon. But when we get there, we're also generating a lot of waste. There's a lot of single-use plastic stuff that doesn't need to be like that, from medications, from sort of, you know, personal protective equipment. Um, and with supply chain analysis, mm is a very complex area of work, but it's a, it's a growing area of work where um, you're able to sort of essentially uh, measure the, the, the life cycle of any product and figure out what its, what its carbon emissions is. Um, so that part, and then figuring out what are some more sort of you know, sustainable materials 
and practices that reduce the overall amount of you know waste and ecological damage that is generated is all part of the sort of you know what the health system needs to do and what health organizations need to do to reduce their impact and even you know referencing another presentation i'm not sure whether roman the the amazing um, vet surgeons in the audience but like his initiative for an environmentally friendly form of ultrasound gel is brilliant there's a lot of examples like that that none of which individually are going to solve the problem but collectively with the sort of the systems analysis and the efficiencies and the sort of ethical framing can make a big difference collectively, I think. Okay, it's time to draw this session to a close. And I, I think we'll all agree the science is clear. We're in this new geological era, the Anthropocene. Um, we're pushing through, as Lachlan says, those planetary boundaries right now. And that this climate crisis is also a global public health crisis. And for me, that Lachlan session is really an invitation to all of us as health professionals, as a trusted members of our, our respective communities, um, to really deeply consider um, the work that we do and also the way that we live so that we can all be part of the solution and not the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Lachlan McIver. Thank you, Lachlan. Nice one. Okay.